Good morning. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Dr. Julie, as well. Um, we want also to make sure that we have an opportunity. I heard that you guys have some tough questions, so we also want to give you some time in a few minutes to pose some as well to Dr. Julie. Let's talk a little bit first um, about Healthy Chicago 2.0 which is a project of this administration and your leadership. It's now about one year into the program. Where That's do things stand? Healthy Chicago 2.0 was a public health plan that we launched about a year ago. Um, the plan itself was a, a citywide plan, not just the Department of Public Health plan. And so in developing that plan, we engaged hundreds of partners, hundreds of organizations, some sitting in the room right now, to help develop the plan and using data to identify health priorities, um, interventions that we should implement, and also um, just an overall plan for the next four years. You know, I asked you earlier if there was also a Healthy Chicago 1.0, and you said that there was, but is it really about, the, what is the distinction there? It's broader than what we might think of as a healthy city. Absolutely, I think one of the key elements that's different about this plan and our prior plan was that it focuses and acknowledges the root causes of poor health in terms of education, transportation, housing, and the environment. So we actually call these issues out as it relates to health. So they're not things that we necessarily own in public health, but that we need to address in partnership with many, many others. Among these things, air quality and what it does, uh, particularly in indoor environments as well. What does the public not understand about that? I mean, I think people, we were talking earlier and you were saying when people think about climate change, they're thinking about the polar bear and the ice caps. They're not thinking about the individual level health, but we know that if air quality is poor, there are health implications in terms of asthma, COPD, cancer. There's horrible implications. And so from my perspective, climate change really is about improving the quality of the environment so that we have healthier lives. We could invest billions and billions and billions of more dollars in terms of healthcare treatment, but what we really need to be focusing on is prevention and improving the climate and assuring that we have um, we don't pre allow for further climate change to occur will help prevent many, many diseases. In just a few days, the city is going to be awarded, uh, formally awarded an EPA award, which there's some irony in, I guess, as well. But um, can, can you talk about what that is really encompassing? I mean, it, it, does that relate to healthy Chicago? It does relate to Healthy Chicago 2.0. One of our um, primary goals in Healthy Chicago 2.0 is to minimize the impacts, negative impacts of climate change. And so the city is being recognized with this 2017 EPA, Department of Energy, Energy Star Award for work that we're doing to improve energy efficiency in the city, which ultimately improves health. This is health related. Um, part of the reason that we got this award is because the mayor has committed to the retrofit Chicago which is a voluntary program where buildings throughout the city can actually agree to meet certain standards so they're more energy efficient by 2025. And at this point, we have 76 buildings that have voluntarily agreed to do that. And the city itself has committed for 100% of our buildings to be energy efficient and be using renewable energy by 2025. So this is all for the sake of improving health. You know, as a layperson, I could understand retrofitting in terms of maybe lead abatement or something of that character, but also maybe greater efficiencies. It's hard, though, for the grassroots to view this as a health issue. I mean, wh what does that have to do with me? Energy efficiency, that's great. I'm going to spend less money heating my house or heating my office space, but what does that have to do with my health? It's cleaner energy as well. I think that's the other thing when we think about it. So there's been major progress made in the city over the past few years under Mayor Rahm Emanuel's leadership um, in terms of improving the air quality. So we, in his administration, the last two remaining coal-fired power plants left the city of Chicago. Um, that improved air quality will improve health. That's improving energy efficiency. Um, in to on top of that, we have now have some of the toughest um, bulk material rules in the nation because we recognize that pet coke storage facilities on the southeast side of Chicago were um, detrimental to the air quality on, in those communities. And so as a result of that, we have these incredibly high standards and we no longer have storage of pet coke in Chicago. It's a fantastic progress that's being made. These things, these uh, coal, 
pet coke led to problems with the health, respiratory problems, eye irritation, nose irritation, things like that. Another element that we've recognized as being a potential problem is manganese. There's a, um, manganese was detected in the environment as a result of some of the work that we were doing for pet coke. And as a result of that, we've asked an agency on the southeast side of Chicago to install monitors to look for dissemination of the manganese into the community to protect the health of individuals in the community because we know manganese has neurologic, can cause neurologic problems in high levels. So, so we, but we know, I mean, this obviously has been a bit of a controversy over the last few months, the manganese question and SH Bell and, and, and the other, um, the other inst installations down there, but uh, let's face it, to, to go back to the EPA, I and mean, what role does federal government play in your ability to actually effectively, because we are talking about, I'm from Washington, we're talking about what the future is of the EPA. Can you speak to the federal role and your ability to make your community any healthier? So for all of public health, especially as we broaden the scope of work that we're doing to look at environment, to look at transportation, housing, we in public health can't do these things alone. We don't own these areas. We really need to do them in partnership with others. And the work and the progress that we've had with the coal plants. Well, so you're saying you're effective there, but so what do you need the APA to, to do in that? I, I was getting to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just going to lean on you a little bit Sure, here. no, it's fine. I think, but I think we couldn't have done that without the partnership of U.S. EPA and Illinois EPA. We work so closely with the U.S. EPA, with Illinois EPA, to help us to be successful. An example of where we really need a U.S. EPA, it was great to hear the panel before because what they acknowledged is that this interstate type of issues are huge. We just had a situation where U.S. Steel dumped hexavalent chromium into a tributary that leads into Lake Michigan. It's not in Illinois. It's in Indiana. We need the US EPA to help us to deal with this issue. We are taking a strong position on this, but we can't do this alone. We need the US EPA, we need Illinois EPA at our side, and we will be much more successful if we have them beside us. You have also written recently about the ACA, which obviously, as a Washington person, I will tell you, is sort of a daily subject of conversation in our neighborhood. Um, the ACA and how it connects, for most of us as laymen, we look at the ACA as being a purely insurance issue. Yeah, it's great. I th thanks for asking that question. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, the ACA, most people recognize the value of the ACA in terms of making sure that more people had insurance. Um, and I think what, from a public health perspective, there were critical elements in the ACA that assured greater emphasis on prevention. So building into um, the insurance plans, allowing for preventive services like mammography, cervical cancer screening, immunizations, those kinds of services were covered 100% at no cost to the individuals. These are critical things that will assure that people have improved health long term and will reduce costs long term. But those were provisions that are under recognized and undervalued. But on top of that, from a local public health, state public health, and CDC perspective, the Prevention and Public Health Fund was a critical fund that made funds available to us to do the core work that we do. It allowed us to be more efficient in our disease outbreak investigations. It allowed us to improve vaccine coverage levels for cancer preventing vaccines like the HPV vaccine. And without the Prevention and Public Health Fund, we would not have been able to do some of the great work that we've done in recent years. I am very concerned that that fund might disappear. Uh, are there other roles in, um, in public health that the ACA covers, for example, as we talk in terms of air quality and, and issues of this nature or, or, or things like uh, uh, chronic disease prevention. Sure, absolutely. I think there was some funding with the Prevention and Public Health Fund that went toward chronic disease prevention. It also supported some of our lead prevention work. I think there's been a lot of attention related to lead because of what happened in Flint in the past couple of years. I think what people don't recognize is that really a lot of progress has been made in terms of lead prevention. A few decades, you know, a decade ago or two decades ago, lead poisoning was about one in four children were lead poisoned. One in now, four. One in four children were lead poisoned. Currently, it's less than one in 100. So huge progress has been made because of public health efforts. And we need to continue our focus on elimination of lead hazards. Gasoline, getting rid of um, lead, gas, lead gasoline. Um, there is getting rid of um, lead in paint. All these things were critical things that led to success with elimination of lead poisoning in children. We still have a lot of work to do, but we can't stop doing that. And prevention and public health funding 
gave us money to actually go into homes, to look at the homes and identify lead hazards and other hazards in the home so that people can pr improve their home environment so they're living in safer environments to improve health ultimately. So, so many elements of the Prevention Public Health Fund really led, could have it, and would have led to long-term health benefits, decreased health costs, uh, and just improved quality of life for millions of people throughout the U.S. I want to encourage questions from our audience. We have folks with microphones here if you have something that you'd like to pose to Dr. Julie as well. Um, you, you give you the 10-second uh, um, opportunity to promote what you have done in the, in the first year. I mean, do you see the progress being substantial? Sure, so I think with Healthy Chicago 2.0, we had over 200 strategies that were outlined within the plan. And as we're about to celebrate our anniversary um, next month, and we've already uh, either in initiated or fully implemented 76% of those 230 strategies. And on top of that, we had hundreds of partners that were already engaged with us. We've added hundreds more partners who are working with us to actually implement the plan. And we are very, very optimistic. I think what we've done is we've also recognized that there's numerous things, that, again, that we will not do alone. We need healthcare systems to partner with us. We need the philanthropic organizations to join us. We need the business community to join us so that we can actually be more successful. And so we have some initiatives addressing housing for the homeless in partnership with healthcare systems. We have other initiatives where we're looking at developing a health and human uh, resource directory in the city of Chicago so that people can access the healthcare services they need. There's all these little piecemeal directories. Some people have little binders that they're using to have this information. We want to harness all the work that's being done by other partners into one comprehensive system that makes it available, but we're doing that in partnership with others. So there's any number of examples of things that we're doing individually, but also many efforts that we're doing in partnership with others. All righty, sir, or me. Hi, my name is Lisa. Um, earlier you mentioned um, some great strides Chicago has been making about eliminating coal-fired power plants, um, eliminating pet coke. I can only imagine that some of those things would move just outside the city, either to maybe southwest suburbs or even to northwest Indiana. Um, when you think about the environment, that maybe helps Chicago and Chicagoans, but doesn't really eliminate the problem. So how do you balance both the economic needs of economically depressed cities, where maybe this is a, a balancing sort of the economy and healthcare, and how does Chicago think sort of regionally or nationally to mediate these issues at a larger level? So I think the question is complicated. In terms of, uh, I think you're asking about whether or not the impact of, if we eliminate the coal-fired coal power plants, that then jobs are lost. And is that what you were asking? That maybe they just move to a more economically depressed area that can't make those kind of trade-offs. Yeah, so I think what we, we have to work in partnership with others, and that's why the state agencies have to be working with us in addition to the national, uh, federal agencies to support our efforts so that we can be more coordinated. I think you are, you're right, we do typically focus on the benefits of our city and our, our residents within our city, but having overarching agencies, whether it's state or at the federal level, helps us to assure that decisions that we make don't have negative impacts on others. You know, there's also that health disparity question. I mean, this is a city. Just within the city, there are 77 neighborhoods. We're talking about some significant disparities that you've identified within the... Definitely. I think that's one of the other key differences between this plan and our prior plan is that we really did focus on using data and focusing on neighborhood level, um, either health behaviors or health conditions to identify those communities that have the greatest need. So our focus is on health equity, which means that we're going to direct the limited resources that we have to those communities, those populations who are most severely impacted by the diseases or who need the most help. So the data really are driving those efforts. My name is Gunter Nitsch. A few times a week I go down my, with my bike to a peninsula on 59th Street. From that angle, there's a brown cloud hovering over the city. My question, will it get worse in the future with the Trump administration? Mm. <laughs> so we have, I like how we turn that, right? <laughs> I go for a bike ride, and what about the Trump administration? <laughs> I think we should put you to work in television. 
So yeah, the, we have a beautiful resource looking at, that we look out over today, and it's incredible. And I take advantage of that on a regular basis running down the lakefront. And to hear that is really, really disturbing that you see this cloud of dust. What I'm really proud of is that we have a really strong environmental permitting and inspection unit within our department. Uh, but we do receive federal funds to support the work that we do. And we won't be as successful, we won't be as effective in terms of monitoring the type of air particulate matter that's released what these um, agencies are doing within our city limits, we won't be able to do that kind of work as well if we don't have ongoing funding. So Has the federal government identified specific areas where you're not going to be getting funding? Uh, have they told you? Not yet. Not yet. But we hear, you know, there's rumors, there's a lot of concern. We are, you know, the city does make investments of our own to support that work because we recognize how important it is. And so I think what, the, our, what we're trying to do right now is figure out where are we dependent on federal funds? Where do we shift our funding to support these kinds of critical work, these, this kind of critical work to make sure that they don't fall apart, systems don't fall apart? We have a strong system in place, but we can't, we can't and we can't afford to let that crumble. But we are, again, dependent on state and federal funds, and we need to continue to get those, or we'll have to shift resources and focus on reprioritize our efforts. Okay. Um, want to thank you for participating. Thank you, Gunther, uh, for taking your ride and giving us a, another thing to think about in there, and appreciate your time as well. Thank you. Thanks so much.